I'm delighted to introduce Jan Lecam, the Chief Executive Officer for Eurodis Rare Diseases Europe. Jan. Thank you very much, Damsin. Thank you, and it's, I feel privileged really to do these closing remarks. And first, as leader of this project, WA 2030, which has been really a fantastic adventure, I'd like to thank the members of the European Parliament who have initiated it and supported it all along. I'd like to thank the European Commission for funding this foresight study and for their guidance. i also like to thank our excellent academic partners in this project and the not less excellent team uh, working on it. The, um, also to thank really our advisors and the experts, the 250 experts in the panel who have dedicated time and reflection to bring it to you uh, today. So let's celebrate this fantastic production. It's a milestone which will inform our journey for the next uh, decade. A foresight has three benefits. An immediate benefit to uh, digest by pieces into the ongoing policies so it can inform immediate action. The second is to prepare for the future, to prepare for the preferred scenario, but also to prepare for the one we hope will not happen, but at least we are prepared. And third, it's that there is a group of individuals like you today online who are prepared with the same vision, a shared vision, to implement it. So for sure the 200 people who have been involved in the project, but maybe after this conference today, 700 or 1,000, we don't know exactly. These policy recommendations are forming a real roadmap. And this has immediate impact on the new EU programs within the multi-annual financial framework 2021-27, to mention some. Obviously, the Europe Horizon Europe research program for the next years, the EU for Health program, which has a great uh, importance for us, but also the European digital uh, health space uh, policy, which are uh, top priority for the upcoming uh, years. And not to forget the European structural funds, which are important at the member states level to fund activities. But second, immediately, it can also inform, and it was mentioned today by, by the commissioner or the representative of the European Commission, it can help to inform some of the ongoing revision of policy. It was also mentioned by several members of parliament, such as the EU strategy on pharma, in terms of unmet needs and access to medicines. It can inform the revision of the orphan drug regulation and the pediatric regulation, but also the incentives. It, and also there is some other policies which are under evaluation like the Directive on Cross-Border Healthcare. And here too, it will be important to reuse some of the elements of this roadmap. Now next year, we'll start a new cycle of the European Funds Network. We heard about ERNs all day long by each policymaker, how important they are. It's going to be a new cycle for five years. And here, we can reuse a lot of the elements from this roadmap, from the foresight, into this next policy. Now, I have to say that I regret that some years ago, we've been heard a lot. Thank you. We have 24 networks. But we also asked at that time for European Funds Network on rare infections which didn't turn out. And also, we hope to have one in this new cycle for the pregnancies of women with rare diseases, which are all complex pregnancies, or women who are affected with a chronic disease or complex treatments. So I hope that will be heard too. But now, for Rare 2030, what it tells us clearly is that an EU policy on orphan drugs plus an EU policy on European Funds Network doesn't make a European policy on rare diseases. It's not sufficient. And I know it sounds strange because you could say, but they tick the box, there is already a lot. No, that's really not enough. Why it's not enough? Because the specific policies are essential, but they are means, they are instruments, they are talking about new products, additional drugs, about networking and activities. They are not talking about achievable results, impact, diagnosis, improving survival and quality of care, which is all about the scenario of this foresight. And for this, we need this holistic approach that goes from research and care, 
that grasp at the middle of the data. You heard it all along. It has to be an integrated strategy between these three elements and also integrated between the member states and the European level. Without this integration, it's all fragmented. It goes nowhere, even with good money and goodwill. It needs to be coordinated. This coordination, the European level has a responsibility, which is to create the umbrella, the policy framework, whatever it is, to make it happen. And this is essential, really, if the ambition by 2030, as agreed in the Sustainable Development Goals, as agreed in the universal health coverage at the United Nations, is to leave no one behind. If we're serious about it, if we're really serious to also address the needs of the 5,000 rare diseases, which affects less than one in a million in the population, the national level is not going to do it. We have to work on it together at the European level. So where are we now? And if we want this scenario to, of investment for social justice, we need to translate this recommendation into action. We could have a bigger problem to be nowhere that we would not know what to do, but that's not the case. We have a clear analysis, we have clear recommendations and we know what to do. We have consensus in a community of multiple stakeholders. That's such a great asset. We have measurable results identified and it's not so expensive to invest in. We cannot leave it just to luck or to chance. We will succeed because we want to succeed because we have designed the right strategy to get there. We have now a unique opportunity ahead of us in the coming years. For Europe, it is to do something good, something right, to be proud of. For the 20 million of people who are suffering in EU today because they are affected by something which is rare, complex. But also there is the high expectations which we heard today in this fantastic film of the young citizens, the new generation calling for even more ambitious policy than what you just heard. Do we want to disappoint these young people? Do we want them to become so disappointed that they will really get nervous and at us and at policymakers to make it happen? No, let's act now to prepare this better future. Europe is an inspiration to the world. When we adopted in 2009 this strategy of national plans for Europe, which then have developed over the years, six, seven years in all member states, except two or three, and not always at the best level, but as much as they could, it has inspired in turn Canada, Mexico, Argentina, Colombia, and progressively most of Latin and Central America, but also New Zealand and Australia. And believe it or not, now the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation, which brings together 21 countries around the Pacific, are working together on national strategies based on 19 pillars, completely inspired by your work in Europe. And this is the moment when we're supposed to stop doing it in Europe because we've done it yesterday. We're completely missing the point. We need to do it. We need to do it for ourselves. We need to do it to help the rest of the world to hold to it. Because part of that coordination is not only European, but has to be global. Rare diseases has been a spare head in healthcare and health strategy so far. So I'd like to speak a bit about COVID. I think the President of the European Parliament, MEPs, ministers have all mentioned COVID, right? Let me mention it in a different way. First, the health commissioner mentioned it, the European Funds Network. They have been extremely helpful immediately from the beginning of the pandemic. It would have been even more helpful if we had this European Funds Network on rare infections, but we'll get it tomorrow, I'm sure. So that was useful, why? Because clinicians could immediately communicate, because there were a platform where to share data from patients to discuss the complex cases. Now, let me take you to the immediate next challenge. Some of the patients with COVID, as you know, may have symptoms long after their infection, two, three, four, five months later. They are called the long COVID. Today, they are into a maze. They don't know where to go. And mostly where they go, it's in rare disease centers for neuromuscular diseases or for rare lung diseases. So let's tackle that immediately. Let's organize at the European level to address the needs of this long COVID. They're gonna be 
only few of them. It's not going to be a prevalent disease. It's a rare disease. It's an immediate challenge. Let's adapt. Let's do it right now. Another example is the vaccine. The vaccine, the RNA vaccine from Pfizer and from Moderna, are both based on technologies which are coming from research performed in Europe on one rare diseases, which is the amyloidosis transthyresis. I'm not saying it right every time I know, but also from research on some rare cancers. Because the science was there, it was possible to accelerate with significant money to get to the vaccine. So I would argue that the return on investment for Europe has already been quite high on investing in research on rare diseases. So continue to do that. Invest in healthcare for rare diseases, invest in research for rare diseases. There is a win for everyone. And also, last but not least, with the COVID, suddenly what was not possible yesterday becomes possible. Member states come together under the European Co Commission to negotiate with laboratories for the vaccines and to do joint purchasing. We are really hoping that this tomorrow will happen for rare disease therapies. Maybe not for all therapies, but at least for the ones which are the most complex, like gene therapy and cell therapies, and for the rarest diseases, because that's the only way to go. If not, we will only increase inequalities and innovation will not get to the patients. So what we have, what we have heard today is that it's the health commissioner is supportive. The Court of Auditors is calling for a revision and adjustment of the policy. The members of the European Parliament are clearly pushing for an improved framework for the next years. And even the President of the European Parliament has sent a very clear message. Rare disease is at the forefront of collaboration between member states and of integration of health strategy between member states. That's a good thing to have when there is health challenges. We have a pandemic today, but tomorrow we may have other challenges which are relevant to health, where we need to collaborate much more. So we need to encourage it even more. And this is what France has done by saying that it, rare disease will be a priority in their EU presidency in the first semester next year. But also the Minister of Health of Czech Republic said it will be a priority for his country during the second semester. And that he's calling for the trio of the presidency with France and Sweden to make it a trio priority. So with MEPs and the members of state, I hope that now the Commission will be on board to prepare a new council recommendation on rare diseases to immediately prepare a draft in order to create all the glue in addition to the silos for a comprehensive approach, integrated approach, so that not only we have a protective hand on people with rare diseases in Europe, on what has been done in the past and continue that kind of national plans and strategies, but also has a helping hand for the rest of the population and focused on public health objective measurable objective to be proud of 10 years from now. Thank you.